What's going on, guys? Welcome back to my Friday Night Smackdown audio review for October 28, 2022. I am Graham G.S. Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great weekend so far. I actually did not watch this show live. I was actually at Rampage last night at Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. Had a fun time. Watched two hours of Dark in place of Smackdown before Rampage went live at 10 p.m. Eastern, which... It was a solid show, your typical Rampage, probably a bit better than usual, just because they had Wardlow on the show for a TNT title defense, they had John Moxley on the show, so that was a fun time. I did watch SmackDown when I got back, though. Super late showing of the show, um, just because I couldn't miss whatever was going to happen on the show. I heard some rumors of might who show up, and obviously, you know, we had the mystery partner for um, the Hit Row six-man tag team match against Legato and Bray Wyatt appearing, among other stuff, the Bloodline, Roman Reigns. It was a pretty stacked show. And I'm glad I stayed up to watch it late last night because I, I I enjoyed it. It wasn't a great show by any means, but um, I thought we had some nice surprises, some decent matches, progression heading into next week, Crown Jewel, and whatnot, and the return of Emma to WWE as well. Uh, although that was not the best thing on the show. It actually wasn't even Bray Wyatt either, and we had the debut of sorts of Uncle Howdy in the main event segment, which we'll get to a little bit later on. Um, it was the Bloodline segment, as I mentioned earlier, with Sami Zayn, Roman Reigns, Solo, The Usos, Paul Heyman. Further teasing tension between Roman and Jay Uso with, you know, Sammy incorporated as well into the mix. Just tremendous stuff I'll get into in a minute, but um, this was a solid show. They did tape next week's show after this one, because obviously next Saturday is Crown Jewel, so a lot like with Clash of the Castle weekend. Mo most pay-per-view weekends, I do not review SmackDown here in audio form on the channel, just because there's a very quick turnaround time, specifically with the international shows that start at, like, fucking noon or 1 p.m. I'm, I'm not even sure if there's going to be a SmackDown lowdown next week. I wouldn't think so, because the pay-per-view airs so early. Um, so I probably, no SmackDown lowdown review next week, and very likely no SmackDown review either, unless I just do it late on Friday, which I probably won't, and um, then we have it up early next morning. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll be skipping the SmackDown review, and again, it's a tape show anyway, so it's really not that big of a deal, but we are breaking down the blue brand this week, starting with the opener, the Bloodline, Sami Zayn and Solo Sokoa taken on Ridge Holland and Butch of the Brawling Brutes. Sheamus was taken out of action a week ago on SmackDown by the Bloodline, uh, injuring his ankle uh, during the match and afterward as well with the post-match angle. So for anyone wondering, and a bit of an update, if anyone wondering, oh, is Sheamus actually hurt? How long will he be out for? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, we found out in the last couple days he actually got married yesterday uh, on, on SmackDown Friday, actually. Uh, so congrats to him on that. Andrew McIntyre was not on the show because he was the best man at said wedding, as well as Miro as well. Miro didn't have to miss any TV time because he's been missing TV time in AEW for fucking months now because <laughs> AEW just clearly has no idea what to do with the guy. Um, but he was at the wedding as well from the photo I saw. So congrats to Sheamus on uh, getting married yesterday. That's awesome. So that being said, I assume he is back in two weeks. Um, I, I don't think he shows up at Crown Jewel. Um, I assume he's probably back on the SmackDown after the pay-per-view. So they already taped next week's show. So it's a nice three weeks off from TV. He comes back to set up. You know, war games with the Brawling Brutes, probably, you know, two other people, Logan Paul maybe, uh, Kevin Owens, McIntyre, maybe, who knows, um, against the entire bloodline. So that's what I would do. But anyway, as far as this match goes, uh, Holland and Butch did pick up the win. It was a fun opener. Solo and Sammy have a great dynamic. Sammy was the one that got pinned here, leading perfectly right into the following segment with Roman Reigns coming out, who was advertised for the show. And again, further teasing tension within the bloodline. This was by far the best thing on the entire show. Um, I, I can't do it justice by recapping exactly what happened, but like I said, it was basically just more dissension within the ranks of the bloodline and Jay Uso getting in Sammy's face saying, I've never liked you. No one's ever liked you. You're not calling him a cancer to the group like Jericho reportedly did to CM Punk, uh, during the net of brawl out last month, but basically saying along those lines, like you're not needed in this group. You're a loser. You cost us to win tonight. What's wrong with you? Blah, blah, blah. And then Roman Reigns kind of interjects. Goes off on, you know, Jay a little bit. And Jay even said, or Solo, or Sammy had said, I, I got on my Sammy, Solo, Roman confused there. Sammy had brought up, well, I was just taking directions from Roman Reigns. That's the only thing I was doing as far as keeping you at bay. And, you know, you're a hothead and I was trying to cool you off, blah, blah, blah. And then Jay, with the line of the segment, says, I don't care what the tribal chief says. Which got a great fucking reaction from everyone in the audience. The camera shot was great. Roman's reaction was great. The ooh, when uh, Roman kind of, his eyes lit up when he heard that was fantastic. Because no one stands up to Roman Reigns in the bloodline. And anyone who has has been put in their place pretty quickly by Roman Reigns. Whether it be Jay early on, Jimmy last year. 
Paul Heyman when he was kind of acting out during the whole Brock Lesnar feud. Uh, Sami Zayn has kind of towed the bloodline line, so to speak. Uh, so he hasn't really felt the wrath of Roman, not yet at least, because it is coming inevitably. Uh, this was great, though. Further teasing the tension between Jay and Sami, getting Roman involved. And it honestly kind of makes you think, are they building the Jay Uso versus Roman Reigns? Roman beat Jay twice to retain the Universal Championship two years ago when the whole Bloodline Tribal Chief stuff first started, almost exactly two years ago, actually. Um, they had their matches, and they were great matches, and Jay really broke out on his own during that point. I mean, he was a part of the Bloodline after that, but, you know, he had some main event matches on SmackDown with Daniel Bryan, Kevin Owens, Roman Reigns, among others, and was killing it week in and week out. So I think this whole thing is amazing. Uh, the acting here was tremendous. And we'll see how this kind of bleeds into war games. And, and they did have Paul Heyman close out the segment in kind of weird fashion. Heyman didn't say anything for the entire segment for the most part until the very end when he said, oh, and be sure to tune into Crown Jewel next Saturday for you know Logan Paul versus Roman Reigns. Because this entire segment had absolutely nothing to do with Crown Jewel. It was really all about the bloodline and really, to me, building up war games because we're probably going to get a five-on-five -five match as we fucking should. Roman Reigns should be absolutely in the match. Uh, Solo, Roman, the Usos, and Sammy against five people, three of which should be the brawling brutes after what we've seen in recent weeks. Um, so that would make sense. And they can have Sammy get pinned in that match, and maybe that's what sets off Roman Reigns, and that's how they turn on Sammy Zayn. Or they could wait even longer. I know they announced this week that Elimination Chamber is coming to Montreal, Canada, which is awesome. It was in Saudi Arabia earlier this year, and that ended up being a pretty solid show. Um, they're going to Montreal, which is where Sammy's from. He got that amazing reaction on SmackDown in Montreal a few months ago. They could do Sammy and Roman on that show. Obviously, Sammy loses, and that bleeds into Sammy and Owens versus the Usos at WrestleMania. Very easy booking, and that's where you have Sammy and Kevin Owens winning the belts, which gives me goosebumps just thinking about it and talking about it right now because that's the you know, organic direction they should be headed with this storyline. But uh, no, this was amazing stuff. And we also found out later on the show, two more matches have been made official for Crown Jewel. So now we're up to seven matches. Uh, it's going to be, I, I thought originally maybe we'll get you know Rollins and Ali for the United States Championship which is not happening, and I don't think should. Um, the last two Triple H pay-per-views have had six matches. This one's going to have seven, and that's fine. Uh, seven matches is acceptable. Anything more than seven, maybe eight, unless one of them's on the shorter side. So um, I think a good seven solid match card is fine, um, but they did add Bailey versus Bianca Belair, number three. I mean, they've had more matches than just three, but uh, this will be their third encounter in recent months for the Raw Women's Championship after Bailey beat Bianca on Monday's Raw. That's going to be a last woman standing match. Very cool. At Crown Jewel. So you know, you know they were going to get a women's match on the show. Ronda Rousey really isn't doing much right now. She had an open challenge on the show. Um, she will not be at Crown Jewel, which makes sense. There's really no reason for her to be. There's no feud right now, so why would you do that? But um, yeah, we're getting Bailey and Bianca again at the pay-per-view for the Raw Women's Championship. Bailey could very easily win that one. And we're also getting, as announced, which is why I brought this up here, the Brawling Brutes will challenge the Usos again for the undisputed WWE Tag Team titles on that show. Um, and I say again because they did the match about a month or so ago, and the Usos retained, obviously. Um, they lost that due to interference from Imperium. And that feud's over, so I don't think Imperium's interfering in this one. And it, it makes sense to run it back. They had a good match the first time. They made it on a SmackDown when they first collided about a month ago. Um, I'm totally fond of them running it back. It is interesting, though, because they're telling the story, which I'll get to right now. The New Day are closing in, um, or the Usos are closing in on the New Day's record as record-setting WWE Tag Team Champions at 484 days or whatever it might be, 85 or whatever it might be. Um, they break that record in a few short weeks. So I'm, I'm assuming that the New Day will challenge the Usos for the championships before the record is probably broken. I think the record is broken, if I'm not mistaken, on the Sunday... Not the day after Crown Jewel, but eight days later, if I'm not mistaken. So they can always do the Brawling Brutes getting a shot at Crown Jewel. The New Day get a shot on the SmackDown after Crown Jewel. And the Usos obviously win. It would be dumb to have them lose there. Um, having them lose to any other team at this point, but Zayn and Owens would be booking malpractice. So hopefully they will beat the Brawling Brutes again in Crown Jewel, at Crown Jewel, and the New Day again on SmackDown uh, the week after Crown Jewel. But speaking of the New Day, they're continuing to roll in tag team action, winning here against the Maximum Male Models, Masse and Mansois. Um, the act is dead in the water, but I will say this. I'm not sure if I mentioned this a week or two ago, but when they put up the vignettes or whatever it was, 
Like, it was a WWE.com exclusive video with Masse and Mansoir. I think it was before one of their matches on SmackDown a few weeks ago. They are fucking hilarious. Um, you, you can tell they're just going over the top with it, and they're real-life friends as well. Um, I don't really care much for Maxine. She's fine in the role as a manager, whatever. I'm sure in the ring she's nothing special. Um, but Masse and Mansoir are really making the most of this really bad, stupid gimmick. And for anyone saying, oh, they might as well just break them up at this point, get them off the show. It, I mean, the gimmick itself sucks, but I think the biggest part of what made it was awful, why it was terrible in the first place, was that LA Knight was attached to it. There was no real reason for him to be involved in that group at all from the get-go. Them on their own, it's a perfectly fine jobber tag team. I, I don't really care much about Mace on his own, uh, the former Dio Madden. Mansoor is great. I think Mansoor is, is, is awesome. I really enjoy Mansoor. Um, I don't really think that he has much of a chance at this current point of getting over on his own when they're bringing back so many people. So keeping him in this tag team, not that they're going to get over, but you know, it's, it's a fine use of them for now. If they want to get Tyler Breeze involved, who got a name drop on the show by Xavier Woods in a uh, pre-match promo, pre-tape promo by Woods. I think it was Kofi actually who brought it up, but, um, and Rick Martell as well. I don't think Rick Martell is coming back to WWE. That doesn't mean that Tyler Breeze is on his way back either, but it would be interesting if they brought him back for a managerial role that LA Knight was in previously with the Maximum Male Models. That wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, speaking of bringing superstars back, we had Ronda Rousey issuing an open challenge for the SmackDown Women's Championship being answered by Emma, the former Tennille Dashwood, her real name, uh, formerly of Impact Wrestling, Ring of Honor, for a very brief period in 2018. Very happy to see Emma back. I was always a big Emma fan in NXT, and on the main roster early on, they really fucked up Emma. She was one of the first people they brought up from NXT, from that version of NXT in early 2014. And she just never got over, and that wasn't her fault. Um, the dancing gimmick had a short shelf life, but when she turned heel in NXT in 2015, she was awesome. The All About Me character, and they didn't bring that music back, by the way. That, that entrance music was great. Um, they did not bring that music back for whatever reason. I don't know why. Um, they, they gave her new music, probably because it was a CFO song and they're not really using CFO music anymore, but the new music sucks. The All About Me catchphrase is cool. that They put that in her song. Um, but yeah, she was actually fired five years ago to the day today. So five years ago today, and she returned yesterday. So almost exactly five years away from the company, uh, she was released. And I remember that too. It was actually five years ago today. I was in New York City uh, for one of those ringside fest things that WWE does, meeting Finn Balor. Um, I think it was just Finn Balor I met. I'm not sure if I met anyone else that day. But I met Finn Balor, and I remember reading on the train on my way back that Emma was released along with Darren Young and I think a few other people, maybe one other person. It was Darren Young. Oh, I think Summer Rae was released as well that day. You know, no Game Changer releases. But it was a bummer to see Emma get fired. Uh, she was on Raw earlier that week, actually, facing and feuding and losing to, to Asuka. She lost to Asuka the pay-per-view. She lost to Asuka um, the next night on Raw, and then she got fired. So she never really got a fair shake, did Emma in WWE. Um, in NXT, like I said, she was great. She had those back-to-back -back awesome matches with Paige, uh, in the, which, who they mentioned, by the way, during this match, they mentioned that she was in the finals of the NXT Women's Championship Tournament to crown the inaugural champ back in 2013, fucking nine years ago. And this woman's only like 31, 33, whatever, which means that back then she was 24, which is crazy. Which, I mean, nowadays they're hiring 19, 20 year olds, which is even crazier. Um, and if they're good, whatever. But anyway, you know, she was in the company that long ago. I think she may have signed in like 2012. So she was here like 10 years ago. And then, you know, they had the rematch at Arrival. That was also great. She fell short both times. In retrospect, she probably should have beaten Paige for the belt because Paige got called up soon after Mania anyway. They probably knew that. She was still champion. She vacated it, so that was kind of a waste. Um, but then Emma also got called up around that point, which is probably why they didn't put the belt on her because she was already appearing on Raw as well. And that was kind of a, like her swan song from NXT at that point. And she fucking floundered. They had her doing the dancing gimmick. She did nothing. Even when they turned her heel in NXT and they brought her back to the main roster in 2016, again, they did nothing with her. They, you know, she got injured for a time, which was unfortunate, but then when she came back and she was clear to compete, they kept her off the show because they wanted to bring her back as Emelina, which was fucking awful. And the never-ending vignettes for weeks and weeks and weeks went nowhere. They brought her in. She ditched the gimmick. Apparently, she didn't like it. Um, they brought her back as Eva Lemma, and again, really didn't do much in 2017 before getting released later that year. So... 
it's not as if she's been ripping it up on the independent scene in her absence. In her absence, uh, she went to Ring of Honor for a short time in 2018, had a fine run there. She went to Impact, and she was there for three years actually. Uh, she was doing this stuff with uh, Caleb with a K and Madison Rain is the influence up until recently. Actually, they were the tag team champions, the Knockouts tag team champions. She never really had any standout matches in Impact, so I'm not sure if she's regressed in the ring or if she was never really that great to begin with or what. I'm not exactly sure because this wasn't a great match either with Ronda Rousey. I thought it was better than some people made it out to be. Um, she didn't look great in there, but I'm not sure if it's because they had no chemistry or if Emma has ring rust, which I'm not sure why, would, why she would be. She was wrestling up until a few months ago. Uh, or if Ronda just isn't, you know, maybe Ronda, I, I saw people say, oh, Ronda didn't carry her aspect of the match or portion of the match. And Ronda's had some pretty decent matches since she's been back in WWE, so I'm not exactly sure what the issue was. This was not great, though, and she reserved, received rather, absolutely no reaction when she came out to the crowd. Uh, they just did not give a fuck about Emma. And honestly, I'm not surprised. Anyone complaining, oh, she got no reaction, like, who gives a shit about Emma, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the woman was gone for five years, and even when she was here five years ago, it wasn't as if she was this big star. I mean, she was literally a stepping stone, and only people who watched the original NXT ten fucking years ago would give a shit about this woman. I saw a lot of love for Emma online, those people weren't in the building, clearly, and she received no reaction, but I'm not surprised she came out and got no reaction. I mean, she's been gone for such a long time. Of all the returns, of all the people they brought back, she probably received the worst reaction, because she is so... such a distant memory in the eyes of fans. You know, we've heard Triple H bringing back people from the last couple of years that were fired earlier this year, last year, two years ago, the fucking club came back, they were fired in 2020. This woman was let go five years ago when she was never a big deal on the main roster. Is she going to be a big deal now? Will she be smacked on Women's Champion? I don't think so. Uh, I think Emma is talented. I'm glad she's getting another shot. Will she get over? Who knows? But other, as other people have brought up, I think reuniting her with Dana Brooke in the tag team division might be the way to go. They have absolutely no fucking tag teams right now. Those belts mean nothing. They have maybe one or two teams maybe three overall between the two brands, which is embarrassing. If they're bringing back so many women, it wouldn't hurt to form more teams. And I think if Emma's not going to really do much on her own, if she's just going to be a stepping stone for other women, uh, first of all, turning her heel is the way to go. Turn her fucking heel. She's much better as a heel. Reunite her with Dana Brooke and have them go after the tag team titles at some point. Dana Brooke is doing nothing. Dana Brooke, to me, is just not that great. She's improved marginally in the last five, six, seven years. Not by a ton. Uh, her promos are awful. Uh, she seems like a perfectly nice human being, but in the ring as a performer, I just think she's abysmal. Putting her with Dana... If you're going to justify keeping Dana Brooke around, trash the 24-7 title, and have her and Emma reunite and go after the tag team titles. That, to me, is the only option that makes sense. And Triple H was running NXT when Emma and Dana Brooke were a team. So, honestly, I don't think it's that far-fetched of a possibility that they could get back together. But... Not the greatest return for Emma here, not off to a strong star. I mean, she lost. I mean, that doesn't really bother me, because of course she was going to lose to Ronda Rousey. But, you know, it was a competitive match. It wasn't as if Ronda squashed the woman, and I thought it was a decent match. I mean, people said it was terrible, and that's fine. From what I saw, I thought it was fine. But, uh, you know, I'm glad to see her back. I think she's a quality addition to the main roster. Will she be world champion, a women's champion? No, I don't think so. She never held any gold of any kind in WWE, which to me is fucking criminal, because she's just too good to not be a champion of some sort in this company, um, but a tag team champion would be better than nothing, so I'm looking forward to seeing her back on the blue brand going forward. Speaking of people being brought back, Shinsuke Nakamura also returned on the show. Um, if you're thinking, it was he even gone in the first place? I mean, he was. Um, he is the go-to guy for mystery opponents and partners right now. He just recently returned to NXT on the go-home show before Halloween Havoc as uh, the opponent for Channing Stax. Is it his Stax Lorenzo? Two dimes was uh, Troy Donovan, who they cut and is now in AEW as part of the factory. So he came out as Stax's uh, opponent on NXT a week or two ago. And now here, he was the mystery opponent, or rather partner, for Hit Row. Top Dalla and Ashanti Adonis against all of Legato, uh, Santos Escobar, Cruz del Toro, and Joaquin Wild. Uh, the 50-50 booking isn't ideal, but this is where you run into the issue of introducing too many people at one time. Now, I know Hit Row have been back now for two months, they haven't exactly gotten over, but having Legato feud with Hit Row, the issue here is that, is that they're both new acts. And the crowds that aren't familiar with them from NXT, which is a majority of people, do not give a fuck about either faction. So having Legato lose here isn't ideal. I get it, though. I mean, you don't want to have Nakamura lose in his return either. So it's like bringing back too many people at once is the problem. 
The match itself was enjoyable. I thought Nakamura and Hit Row had fine, enjoyable chemistry together. Nakamura was spotlighted by picking up the win for his team. This is what you kind of have to do with the newer acts, is by having them align and associate themselves with more established people. Nakamura should not be in Hit Row, but having Hit Row team with people like the Prophets and people like Nakamura will hopefully get them more over in the long run. Same thing with Legato. Legato was great, but I think you know interjecting Zelina Vega in there in place of Electra Lopez was the right role, not only because Electra Lopez was not ready for the main roster in the ring, but also because Zelina is established on the main roster. So having her in there in place of uh, Electra makes the most sense. So this was fine. Uh, they got to find some direction for Nakamura, though. It's it's great to see him back on SmackDown for the first time in two months in the ring. But, like, he already challenged Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship. He lost. He does have unfinished he does have unfinished business with Roman Reigns for that top championship. He just has no credibility right now, so it's hard to take him seriously as a threat to that title. Maybe they can do the match on SmackDown after a Survivor Series and between that and the Rumble. Maybe. Um, they did it at tribute to the troops last year, but barely anyone saw it, so I would run in the, I would run that back. Maybe they're waiting for Rick Books to be back, and they can have them challenge for the tag titles, uh, although they already lost at WrestleMania. So I'm not really sure what more you do with Nakamura. Maybe he can be the first real rival for LA Knight, who's having a match, I think, next week, or soon at least, with uh, Ricochet, which is cool. You know, Nakamura is a fine opponent for someone like LA Knight as well, so we'll see in uh, due time if that's where they head. If that's the direction they're going. Carrying Cross in action as well on the show, taking on and beating Madcap Moss, who's so fucking dead in the water. You know, I will say this. Moss, the name is terrible. They repackaged him to the... I mean, kind of. I mean, they just stripped away all the dumb laughing stuff, which was awful. Don't know why he still has that stupid name. So the match itself was whatever. But here's the thing with Moss. I'm, I've never been the biggest Riddick Moss, Madcap Moss fan. Um, I wasn't a big fan of his in NXT. I thought he was fine. That he was kind of generic, but he was okay. He was passable. Came up as part of the 24-7 bullshit two and a half years ago with Mojo Raleigh. Did nothing. Wasn't that great then. Crowd didn't give a fuck about him. And then he came back, did this stuff with Corbin. That wasn't entertaining. He broke away from Corbin. Corbin has so much heat that he actually beat Corbin and got over. People, some he actually got some decent reactions for several months in a row there, but because he's had no momentum under Triple H, Triple H seemingly does not give a shit about Madcap Moss which is why he hasn't probably gotten Riddick Moss back yet. Um, I think he's perfectly content with positioning Moss as a stepping stone for other people on this show. I think that much is pretty apparent. And the problem is that you already have enough of those people on the babyface side of the Ricochet and Nakamura. you got to push one of them. Unfortunately, Moss is just not that guy. He's just not that guy, pal. He's not. Um, he's decent. I, I, I've seen a lot of people say, oh, maybe he could be a future world champion. I do not see Madcap fucking Moss as the future WWE champion. I just I just can't. Um, this was more of a spotlight match for Cross. It was a bit more competitive than it probably needed to be. Cross squashing Madcap probably would have worked better. But it was decent. Cross wins. No McIntyre on the show because like I said, he was at Sheamus' wedding so that makes sense as they head into Crown Jewel for the Steel Cage match between Cross and McIntyre. And then the closing segment, Uncle Howdy interrupting Bray Wyatt who cut yet another babyface promo. Um, the entrance is cool. The promo is more of the same of what we got two weeks ago. And now we got our first real look at Uncle Howdy. And as someone pointed out on Twitter, he was wearing the same cross earring, I think, as Bo Dallas when he was in, uh, I think, one of the Miztourage members a few years ago. That could be a complete coincidence. I don't think it is. A lot of the stuff with Bray Wyatt is done intentionally. Um, there were rumors coming out of Extreme Rules a few weeks ago that he was on his way back to the company, was Bo Dallas, so... I fully expect it to be Bo Dallas under the Uncle Howdy mask, whether they reveal it to be him or not. Um, that would just make sense. Which is why it sounded like Bray. They could have pre-recorded this and it was Bray Wyatt under the mask. But I think having it be Bo Dallas would make a lot of sense. I mean, he's his brother, not his uncle, but still. Um, the Uncle Howdy mask looks terrifying. It looks great. Um, they're progressing this at a nice rate. You can't go on for weeks and months on end without really giving us much, but... I will say this, with the Bray Wyatt stuff, they're slowly giving us more with whatever he's doing next. He obviously returned at Extreme Rules. Week one on SmackDown, he, you know, the the lights went out, he was interrupted by that masked figure. Two weeks ago, or last week rather, he was, you know, interrupted, or they showed a vignette later on for Uncle Howdy. And we heard, Howdy, and that was it. This week, Uncle Howdy, we heard from him, and we saw the complete mask. 
So it's not as if they're not giving us anything. The way they're progressing this is good. I'm invested. It was the right way to close out the show. Another cool, another cool cliffhanger. And I was a fan of it. So, um, yeah, I thought the way they, they kind of broke this down was good. I, I still don't know where the fuck they're going with this, but I would assume Bo Dallas will be involved in some form or fashion. Are we still getting a Y at 6? I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I thought this was uh, well done. I'm curious to see where they go with the next. So, overall, a solid SmackDown. Uh, not a great show. Not the most exciting two hours ever. Uh, certainly more eventful than Raw. At least we had Emma back on this show, uh, challenging Ronda Rousey for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Nakamura is back, and the Bloodline stuff was tremendous. So, uh, overall, I would say a thumbs-up show for the Blue Brand this week for October 28th, 2022. Thank you guys for checking out my review. I appreciate it. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. As I said earlier, uh, we will have a SmackDown Lowdown review either later today here on the channel or tomorrow. But as I mentioned earlier, though, very likely next week, no SmackDown Lowdown review. I don't think they're even doing it next week due to the pay-per-view being so early on Saturday. Um, but also no SmackDown review either for the same reason. The pay-per-view is so early, uh, I probably won't have a chance to review it before the pay-per-view goes live, so... It's a tape SmackDown anyway. I can't imagine it's going to be that great of a show. So um, my written review will be up at some point. Doing an audio, audio review of the show, probably not going to happen. We will have other content here on the channel in the place of a SmackDown review and a SmackDown Lowdown review, so keep an eye out for those. Uh, with all that being said, guys, have an awesome rest of your weekend. I'm Graham G. Matthews. Enjoy Halloween in two days, and I'll catch your ass down the road.